Uh, my name is Mark Bear. I have the honor this year to serve as the Dean for Arts and Humanities at Hope College. I'm also pinch hitting, to use a baseball metaphor. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, for Ryan White and Jonathan Haygood, who could not be here. So I want to um, introduce you to what this is, which is the Liberal Arts Lecture Series. This lecture is entitled Restoring Love to the Intellectual Life as part of that. And the series is designed for those of you who are not HOPE students uh, to explore how the liberal arts can shape our lives. It's sponsored by the First Year Seminar Program and the Senior Seminar Program. So I want to thank those two programs for what's been a really great series so far. Uh, our speaker tonight is R.R. Reno. I'm going to call him Rusty because R.R. Reno is too many R's and, and Rusty is shorter. So since 2011, he has been the editor of First Things, which is a religious magazine aimed at, quote, advancing a religiously informed public philosophy for the ordering of society. Another way to say that is um, Rusty Reno is that rare but absolutely necessary person for this moment in our history. He is a Christian public intellectual. I read First Things not because I agree with everything in it, but, but because I want to be challenged by what's in it. I want to keep thinking about whether what I believe is, is true or not, and it, and it serves a wonderful purpose. So if you don't subscribe, I think you should do that. Uh, Rusty has a PhD from Yale University, and before joining uh, the staff of First Things as its, as its editor. Uh, he was a professor at Creighton University for a couple of decades, so he, he is both a journalist, if you will, a Christian public intellectual, a lapsed professor. A recovering, a recovering professor, sorry. <laughs> so I want to acknowledge the people who uh, uh, paid some money to bring him and spend a day at Hope College. Uh, that's my colleague, the Dean for the Social Sciences, and then the Departments of Political Science, Philosophy, History, as well as the St. Benedict Institute, as well as the Cultural Affairs Committee. So he's going to talk for about 40 minutes or so. Uh, when he's done, he will answer questions, and we will be out the door at 8 o'clock. I need to do one more thing, and that is uh, tomorrow he's going to fly back to New York City. People there are going to ask him where were you? What were you doing? He's going to say, I was at Hope College. They're going to say, well, I think that's in Michigan, but where exactly is that? What you could do is this. <laughs> but when I encountered that having moved here, I was weirded out, <laughs> to, to be honest. Rusty, I would not do that, OK? Just, so instead of that, we want to give you a present created by a local artisan. You just show them this, and they will see where Hope College is. Would you please join me? Thank you. Oh, your well, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's really wonderful to be on this beautiful campus. Um, Y'all are doing a, a great thing here at Hope College, and I've met a number of students very impressed with the enthusiasm that you have for your institution and faculty and their enthusiasm to be your teachers and mentors. What I want to do today is I want to talk about educational culture in maybe a way that you haven't really uh, been exposed to. Uh, and I hope that I, I hope I, I am a recovering college professor, uh, which I hope does not mean that I'm overly tedious in the next 40 minutes. So, um, but uh, you can be the judge of that. Midway through my career as a college professor, I began to have misgivings about the academic culture in today's universities. And my concerns, they revolved around what I thought was a superficial and false intellectualism that <clears throat> was encouraged by higher education. In some circles, it seemed to me, in some circles, irony has become the ideal, not informed judgment. An attitude of knowingness seems to have replaced knowing. We appear to have entered an era of widespread distrust and suspicion. Scholars talk about the hermeneutics of suspicion. Student fac and faculty are trained to avoid being duped by advertisers, by ideologues, and other hucksters of snake oil wisdom. And this goal, this goal of not being duped, not being deceived, not being taken, 
has become more important than affirming truth. Now, to a great degree, our academic culture encourages this, men this mentality in, uh, to, to, to too great of a degree. As I put it in a number of essays that I've written recently, it was kind of hard as I prepared. I didn't want to just give you guys the same old, same old that I've been working on for the last couple of years and uh, try to force myself to think in a deeper way about this issue. But I've been circling around this issue for quite a while now. And as I put it in the past, when you get a group of college professors together or educated, educational administrators together and you ask them, what is the goal of higher education? They often have a hard time coming up with any kind of clear vision. Ah, but they can ultimately agree that at least our purpose should be to inculcate into students the habit of critical thinking. So our goal is to get students to think critically. And in practice, this means disenchanting students by raising doubts and giving priority to questions rather than providing answers. Now, it seems to me in itself, critical thinking can be a good thing for the intellectual life. We have a natural human ten tendency, or maybe it's a fallen human tendency, towards complacency. And there are times when we need to be forced to question our beliefs. And we need to broaden our horizons. And both the Greek philosophical tradition and the Old Testament put a strong emphasis on critical thinking. Socrates, for instance, was famous for his questioning of conventional wisdom. The prophets of Israel pronounce words of judgment against Israel's idolatry, and which, is a, which was the conventional religious approach in the ancient Near East. So in both cases, something like critical thinking purifies by exposing falsehoods as false. And this is surely the necessary first step toward affirming truths as true. And how can we affirm truths as true when we're too busy affirming falsehoods uh, that are false? So to develop as an intellectual, the dross of error needs to be burned away, and critical thinking can help us do that. Here's the problem, though. Today, critical thinking is put forward as the essence of the intellectual life, not as an aid in its development. As a consequence, we lose sight of something more basic. An intellectual is something who prizes truth above all. He will not be swayed by convenience and convention. And then we're all fallen creatures, of course, and no intellectual's devotion to truth is perfect. But to be a true intellectual, that devotion must be sincere, stable, and binding. And therein lies part of our problem. Today, higher education does not seek, by and large, to cultivate devotion. And there's more to it than devotion. The intellectual needs to, to desire truth. I spoke about that in the chapel talk this morning. Desire is a really important component of the intellectual life. Because truth is something we presently lack and therefore we must go outside of ourselves to find it. This means that at the root of the intellectual life is love. For to love something is to seek an ever greater union with it, which is exactly what the genuine intellectual desires in relation to truth. To be, intellect, to be an intellectual is to love truth, to desire an ever greater union with truth. Now the central role of love is evident in the way we speak about intellectual inquiry. We have terms like sociology, psychology, and even theology, and these literally mean the rational study of. The, uh, the ology part is the rational study of society, or the rational study of the soul, or even the rational study of God. But when you go to the Greek thinkers, and early Christians for that matter, they used a different term to describe the overall pursuit of truth and the full co cultivation of the life of the mind. And the term they use is philosophy, not, not sophiology. Sophiology is the rational study of wisdom. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. They recognized, and again, this was true of biblically influenced thinkers just as much as ancient Greek pagans, 
They recognize that we will never gain a larger view of reality unless we aspire to it. Larger truths are elusive. We can't attain them unless we're animated by love's sometimes reckless passion. And even more so than devotion, reckless passion is exactly what today's emphasis on critical thinking tends to work against. So that's my statement of thesis, that we live in a time when critical thinking works against our need for some, uh, the passion of love to, draw, to draw, us, draw us out of ourselves to seek truth. I want to kind of step back now, though, and speak a little bit about how I came to these insights and what I think they're what I, what I think is a deeper meaning to our captivity to critical thinking. Now, in the mid-1990s, I taught a number of times in Lithuania, and the country had only recently secured its independence from the Soviet Union, where communism was officially, uh, or where the communism that dominated was officially atheistic, which meant that nobody was permitted to study theology. And a, a courageous and indomitable woman, Egle Lamenskaite, she invited me to t come and teach some short courses on postmodernism and theology. <laughs> oh, you want me to do that? Okay, fine. So I, I came to Vilnius, Lithuania to teach on postmodernism and theology. And we taught in this room that was, uh, it, was her, it, was, it was both her office and it was also the seminar room, very small room. And so I would give my lectures. And I was lecturing on Jacques Derrida, and she would be working in the back of the room, but she could hear everything I was saying. And I was lecturing on Jacques Derrida, and he's a figure, a very important figure who I regard as a spiritual theorist of postmodern nihilism. Sorry about that, it was quite a mouthful, wasn't it? I told you I'm a recovering professor. And she said to me after I gave my talk on Derrida, she said, Derrida is following in the tradition of Sextus Empiricus. Another academic, uh, gesture, but it's kind of necessary, and I'll, I'll develop that more. Her comment immediately struck me back in 1994, 1995, as correct. Derrida was a particularly talented proponent of what I'm calling critical thinking. His distinctive method is called deconstruction, and it has a technical meaning of great complexity. But I think, from our purposes, we can see it in fairly simple terms. Deconstruction seeks to weaken truth, just as radical skepticism, which is what Sextus Empiricus represented, radical skepticism in ancient philosophy sought to neutralize the power of truth claims. In both cases, the ancient skepticism and modern deconstruction, in both cases, the weakening is proposed as humanizing rather than nihilistic released from love's compulsive desire for transcendent truth, ancient figures such as Sextus Empiricus promise that we can live more calmly and at peace. If nothing is worth fighting for, then nobody will fight. If nothing is worth sacrificing for, then no one will have to make painful sacrifices. Thus, Derrida's deconstruction and the ancient skeptical tradition did not counsel despair for a long time, I thought, how could anybody think that there's no meaning to life and not come to despair? They were not counseling despair. Instead, their aim was to make life more livable by dissuading us from desiring truth and all the troublesome things that fo follow in the wake of that desire. Now, the same thing can be said about Epicurus, another important ancient figure, who was a proponent of materialism. And his, uh, his disciple, Lucretius, uh, an important poet who put into verse materialist philosophy in an epic poem called De Rarum Natura. The only, well, that's not true. I suppose there are other epic poems that are uh, epic poems of philosophy, but the most, one of the most interesting epic poems of philosophy. I've come to see that materialism also functions as a disenchanting philosophy. If we recognize that everything is reducible to the random motion of atoms in the world, then we can be released from anxieties about the meaning of life, allowing us to just get on with our lives. So Epicurus and Lucretius, they did not have access to MRI machine, machines to do brain scans. But we can imagine a modern materialist conducting experiments to show that philosophy itself 
a cultivated love of wisdom is really just a neural network in the front lobe of our brains. Or if Epicurus were to return as an evolutionary scientist, he would show that our desire for truth, like our sexual desire, is an evolved characteristic that in some way provides an evolutionary advantage that helps us pass along our DNA and triumph in the competition for the survival of the fittest. Again, the idea here is not to depress us with meaninglessness. Instead, Epicurus thought that materialism brings freedom from despair precisely because it disabuses us of unrealistic hopes and idealistic aspirations. Um, if you don't hope for anything, I mean, there's, um, um, uh, you know, uh, if, you don't, if you don't want something, then you won't be disappointed if you don't get it. If you don't hope for something, you won't be disappointed that, that the hope is not realized. Uh, so hope not, want not, kind of is the motto, I think, for both uh, ancient skepticism and ancient materialism. Now, in the years since that remarkable experience in Lithuania, I have become more and more sensible of the moral and spiritual allure of critical thinking. It rarely takes the elaborate form of Jacques Derrida's deconstruction, nor does it adopt the radical skepticism or thoroughgoing materialism, either ancient or modern. But critical thinking in its present form always involves disenchantment. That's always its dynamic, is a dynamic of disenchantment. If a young person comes to college with strong religious beliefs, many faculty agree that he needs to be challenged by critical thinking. The same goes for some with ardent conservative political loyalties or traditional convictions about uh, culture, especially as they concern male-female relations, sex, marriage, and family. Um, they also need to be challenged. And now, in the academic culture of critical thinking, it's important to recognize that the problem here is not one of truth or falsehood. At issue is the intensity of conviction, which our society now regards as dangerous. So having intense substantive beliefs about truth is seen as dangerous. Critical thinking, therefore, isn't meant to be a corrective stage in the larger pursuit of truth. The goal, instead, is disenchantment for its own sake. Loyalties need to be weakened so that students will become more tolerant, more accepting, and more inclusive. Now, Sextus Empiricus and Epicurus did not have, these ancient philosophers did not have th these kinds of social goals in mind. Their skeptical and materialistic outlooks gained influence after Rome had shifted from a republic to an empire and the disenchantment that they encouraged was meant to help well-educated well citizens of Rome, uh, of, of the Roman Empire, reconcile themselves to the, their relative impotence. Uh, maybe some parallels, actually, to our own time. It was felt to be a consolation to know that nothing matters when one has so little scope for independent agency. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Life is full of disappointments, and of course, death casts its long, dark shadow. Under the circumstances, nihilism does not bring despair, but instead what the ancients prize, which is peace of mind. Nothing matters, and so we can relax and need not worry too much over the meaning of our lives. Now, to some degree, the recession of Christianity's influence from the West contributes to an enthusiasm for disenchantment which is one reason why critical thinking has become so important in higher education. If we must face our guilt and shame without the promise of God's forgiveness, it makes a good deal of sense to explain away human freedom as an illusion, as many materialists do, or to argue for moral relativism, which is the skeptical solution, because both, truth, both approaches weaken moral truth which in turn weakens unpleasant feelings of guilt and shame. And the same thing goes for the death. St. Paul mocked death. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? In doing so, though, he relied on the resurrection of Christ. Today's unbelievers do not so much mock death as downplay it with talk of the circle of life, say, or they simply encourage 
resignation. So there are, I think, reasons, spiritual reasons why we want to have a, weakened, a, a weakening of truth to console us uh, in the face of our guilt and shame and the prospect of our impending deaths. Now, all that said, however, the postmodern West remains influenced by its Christian past, which means that we are still motivated by a vision of the world that is transformed and perfected. We still have a progressive vision of the future. For this reason, critical thinking not only functions for us in the same way it did for Sextus Empiricus and Lucretius and other ancient thinkers. Instead, it tends to have an urgent and almost missionary quality, critical thinking does. This is because critical thinking is seen as the way in which higher education, not exclusively, but it's become one of the dominant ways in which higher, higher education is to prepare students to bring peace and justice to our society. So I think critical thinking is a kind of therapy of the soul that prepares students to bring peace and justice to our world. By this way of thinking, inculcating doubts and uncertainties into students and indeed into ourselves as professors becomes a positive duty. We entertain a dream about the future, one in which a culture with weak beliefs tentatively affirmed will be a kind of utopia it will be a world of nonviolent cooperation that's characterized by what is often referred to as an affirmation of difference. In a word, critical thinking has become the crucial intellectual method for promoting social justice. So, in sum, with respect to my analysis of critical thinking, critical thinking has emerged as the highest ambition in higher education precisely because it weakens convictions. That's its goal, its aim, its purpose. This weakening is sought for its own sake and not as a means to the greater end of guiding students towards, towards a firmer and stronger and more reliable devotion to truth. Today, we prize dis disenchantment as a therapy of the soul. Our goal in higher education is to encourage the development of accepting non-judgmental personalities in our students rather than cultivating in them a potentially fierce and jealous love of truth. So I'm gonna stop here and, or, or digress and make two comments about this analysis I've given, which I think is hyperbolic. I'm giving a, I'm giving a kind of uh, one-sided analysis of what I regard as how, why critical thinking has such a dominant role in the way that faculty view the purpose of higher education. So, two comments. When I speak on this topic, people often point out that a great deal of higher education engages in a positive pedagogy that confidently inculcates into students strong convictions about truth. The natural sciences provide the obvious example. And as do technical disciplines in STEM fields. And I think this objection accurately portrays what goes on in classes in electrical engineering, in nursing, in physics and so forth. But I do not think it contradicts my main point. From Blaise Pascal, the great uh, mathematician and, and uh, uh, philosopher, I learned an important truth about the life of the mind. And it's this, science provides us with firm but existentially inconsequential truths. At the, you know, as I told my students, there's nothing you will learn in your biology class that will help you know what to say to your dying parent. So it's just not going to help you. It's not going to console you uh, when you face these. It's not going to help you decide who to get married to or whether to get married. Um, so it doesn't, they're existentially inconsequential. At their best, the STEM fields do not pretend to provide wisdom. They are not oriented towards truths that illuminate the meaning of life, nor do they help us understand how we should live or what we should live for. As a consequence, the postmodern imperative of disenchantment need not bother itself with the first and second laws of thermodynamics. We can have a scientific and technological culture that is thoroughly disenchanted. In fact, one sure strategy for promoting disenchantment is to insist that the only real truths are scientific ones. For that weakens truth by encouraging uh, 
not by encouraging relativism, but instead by encouraging scientism. Now, there's a second objection that comes when some point out that today's educational environment is sometimes characterized by a fierce political correctness that's enforced with a great deal of zeal. And this seems to contradict my notion about a kind of weakened, non-judgmental uh, uh, truth. This suggests, as critics say, a selective application of critical thinking rather than wholesale disenchantment. I find this objection unpersuasive as well. Political correctness is best understood as enforced disenchantment rather than a rival system of strong convictions. Take a look at the terms of abuse in political correctness. Transgressors of political correctness are not criticized for being wrong. They are described as judgmental or bigoted. The sin is not against truth, the sin is against tolerance or inclusion or diversity and the different terms will depend upon circumstances. The paradox of contemporary university culture that celebrates uh, critical thinking and at the same time enforces an elaborate code of conduct, politically correct conduct is an apparent contradiction and not a real one. What we have today is moralistic anti-moralism, one that denounces strong beliefs as divisive and hateful while announcing itself to be committed to, aff to affirmation and acceptance. The object in both politically correct judgmentalism and disenchanted non-judgmentalism is essentially the same. What we want today is the weakening of strong truths, not for the sake of truth, but in order to make, a world, make the world a better place. So we want weaker truths because we believe that weaker truths will make the world, weaker truths more weakly um, affirmed will make the world a better place. So let me shift now to uh, what I think is the better way now, it seems to me obvious that we need to be challenged and our society begs for reformation. But it's important to recognize how differently our tradition, uh, our older pre-modern, our older not post-modern tradition has seen this process of challenge and reformation. Sexus Empiricus and Epicurus are outliers in the ancient tradition. In the main, the solution to our captivity to error, indifference, and indifference to injustice has been a pedagogy of enchantment that inflames in us a love of truth, not the way of disenchantment, which seeks to cultivate indifference. As a young teacher, I was knocked out of a kind of complacent commitment to critical thinking when I read Saint August or I taught St. Augustine's Confessions. Professors can read books, but they don't really understand them until they have to teach them. Uh, and then you go, like, what is, this what is the author really saying? Wow, I, I, I never really paid much attention. Um, after reading a book of ancient philosophy, St. Augustine embarks on his own intellectual journey. He falls into a sect that teaches a dualistic view of the divine as divided between good and evil. And after reading other philosophers, he comes to the belief in God as the all-good creator. And then he att attends a church in Milan and he hears fine sermons. And he becomes convinced of the truth of Christianity. Yet, in a, yet though in a certain sense he believes, he cannot free himself from his existential loyalty to falsehood. He twists and turns, as he describes it, he twists and turns, but cannot break the chains that bind him. My love is my weight, that's what Augustine says. And by that he means that his soul marries itself to what it imagines to be true. It's too bloodless, therefore, to, to speak of false beliefs, as if we can just check our math, as it were, and cure ourselves of error. Any consequential belief is best understood as a love, which means that false beliefs are, at root, false loves. For that reason, even though Augustine saw the error of his beliefs, he could not be free from their falsehood. Only a true love has, can overcome the power of a false love. We need to be romanced away from error, which is exactly how Augustine describes his conversion and that of his friend, Alapios. Addressing God after his conversion, he writes, you pierced our hearts with the arrow of your love. Sort of a beautiful fusion of the Song of Songs with an ancient idea of Cupid. A similar, a similar review can be found in Plato's Symposium, where Socrates recounts his own teacher's account of love's power to propel us towards the highest truths. But I prefer the vivid imagery 
of the opening allegorical chapters of the book of Proverbs. I apologize to the students from uh, this morning's chapel talk that I drew from this paragraph of my lecture tonight here the second time. There in those chapters, the men of the city allow themselves to be seduced by prostitutes and loose women. This sexualized image is commonly used in the Old Testament to connote the worship of false idols. In the book of Proverbs, Lady Wisdom tries to teach the men of the city the error of their ways, and she does so by recounting all the bad consequences that will follow from their false loves. One could say, in fact, that Lady Wisdom deplo deploys critical thinking in order to disenchant the bewitching idols that have uh, seduced the men of the city. Such an approach, however, in the book of Proverbs, in the way that the story goes in the book of Proverbs, such an approach does not work. So Lady Wisdom changes her pedagogical strategy. She retreats to her palace, lays out fine food and wine, and then sends her most beautiful maidservants out into the city to call the men to her banquet. She seeks to counter the seductions of error by presenting truth in an even more alluring form. She enchants, and her enchantment leads the men of the city out of their love of that which is false and toward a love of that which is true. So if we wish to, uh, with those thoughts in mind, with those images in mind, I believe that if we wish to cultivate a desire for wisdom, then we need to give priority to enchantment rather than disenchantment in higher education. This need not mean discarding critical thinking. As I said earlier, pressing hard questions is part of the intellectual tradition in the West, as we see in the figure of Socrates and in the Old Testament prophets. But this moment of critical questioning needs to take place within a more encompassing pedagogy of love and devotion. Now tradition, I want to speak, you know, how do we, how do we restore or how do we cultivate a pedagogy of love and devotion? Tradition plays a key role in this kind of pedagogy. And tradition means a kind of handing or passing on. It's the transmission of an inheritance. And higher education naturally has been characterized by rituals such as matriculation and graduation because the old view was that students are being initiated into something sacred, a sacred tradition of learning. Given, giving priority to the functionalism, to functionalism and efficiency tends to downplay these, these rituals. Another enemy of ritual is anxiety about hierarchy and the desire to make everyone feel equal. These are among the many ways in which we disenchant all of our social relations, including higher education. And these need to be resisted, I think, if we want a pedagogy of devotion. Because ritual inculcates devotion and if we're to escape the gravitational pull of disenchantment, we should encourage the re-ritualization of academic life. So perhaps Hope College professors should wear their academic, academic gowns to class on a regular basis. I went to high table at uh, Cambridge University and I, I had to wear, they had gave me, as a guest, they gave me a pair of academic gowns to wear to, to high table and I found myself enchanted uh, by the ritual. Uh, but I'm an American and so I'm not always comfortable with these sorts of rituals, but it's something worth thinking about, how to re-ritualize the academic life. Another thought, the very name professor suggests a form of life that provides a role model of devotion. A PhD, I can testify, does not train one to teach. Instead, it trains one in a discipline. And at its best, this kind of graduate study, which takes place over many years, forms a person in a deep way, making him loyal to the distinctive methods and achievements of his discipline. That's why professors can fight so bitterly over curricula, because they are so devoted to their own discipline. It's a good thing. For this reason, a teacher in higher education does not teach in the same way that a primary and secondary t school teacher approaches instruction. A professor wants his students to learn, of course, I should hope, but over the course of a semester, a genuine college-level class in philosophy or psychology or physics needs to en enact 
or in some way perform the discipline. And so in this context, so-called student-centered learning is a mistaken concept. A pedagogy of enchantment is always professor-oriented, not in a selfish sense of making things easy for the professor, but because students are invited, I think, in higher education, students are invited into what the professor professes. So unless the professor professes, you can't have higher education. Students are invited to what the professor professes, invited into the professor's love of his discipline. Taken as a whole, however, higher education needs to be more than merely a diverse set of disciplines from which students choose. There needs to be a core or a canon that serves as a common shared focus for an academic community. And we invariably argue over what should that core or canon be. Well, it's inevitable we should argue about such things. Or as my less combative friends like to say, have a conversation about such things. But I'm something of a pugilist, so I like arguments. A pedagogy, a pedagogy of enchantment, after all, is not static or authoritarian. However, we need to make a promise to students. And that's what a kind of a core curriculum makes a promise to students, or a canon of assigned literature makes a promise to students. And the promise is this. If you devote yourself to these books and to this tradition, you will not just become more learned, you will see the world in a fuller and a more comprehensive way. That's the promise that a core curric curriculum makes. If you study Plato and Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, Calvin, or any number of other great figures in our tradition, you will attain a margin of wisdom. If you devote yourself to this tradition, you will be rewarded. In an important way, a core or a canon outlines a path of ascent, a, a rising path of ascent, which is what we need if higher education is to merit the claim to go higher. Now these and other features of an education, these are, I think, features among many others of an educational culture that enchants. Good lectures, for instance, and I can't presume to say this is one of them, but good lectures are performances that at their best draw us in, enchant. A well-run seminar gathers students in a shared spirit of inquiry, and that kind of enchants the soul. Uh, the presence of book-laden shelves in faculty offices are symbols of devotion to their discipline, and they remind us that our love of learning has no end. But I can't outline all the details of what a pedagogy of love would look like. Every institution in any event is unique. And, and, so, and so I couldn't begin to be presumed to, to, to uh, give advice about Hope College. And also, we should recognize that what is crucial is the teleology of an educational culture. Teleology, which means what is, we need to be clear that what is crucial is the end, the goal, and the ambition of an educational approach. Not its administrative structure or its range of subjects. Dante's Divine Comedy can be taught in a way that disenchants young people who harbor hopes that they might find lasting truths in that classic text. It can be taught in a disenchanting way. Or it can be taught in ways that encourage those hopes. My conclusion. I believe we live in an era of weakening. I think it's been an era of weakening that's, I think, characteristic of the post-World War II uh, culture in the West. A consensus now dominates that regards strong, life-engaging truths as a threat to human flourishing. We've even reached a point at which the plain truth about our bodies, that is to say whether we are male or female, is being called into question. To speak of gender assigned at birth is to engage in radical disenchantment. And I don't want to engage tonight in some tiresome refutation of transgender ideology, which is in any event beside the point what I, want, what I want to say. This ideology is part of a moral and spiritual project, not an intellectual one. It seeks a therapy of the soul oriented towards indifference and, and acceptance. And this sort of approach is seen as necessary in order to usher in a utopia of equal freedom, which is interpreted to mean the universal affirmation of everyone 
in whatever way they wish to be affirmed. I think that's our utopia, that we all be affirmed in any way that we wish to be affirmed. Instead, I want to draw attention, so instead of digressing into transgender ideology, but I think it's an interesting case study in, 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 this, um, in, our, in our strategy of weakening. Instead of that, I want to draw attention to our situation as educators, which is, I think, a difficult situation. If we are to be, if, if we are, if we are discouraged from thinking that our bodies can speak to us with clarity about the truth of who we are, then it will be very difficult to encourage young people to seek moral and spiritual truths that are much more remote and uncertain than the male and female character of our bodies. It's gonna be very difficult to encourage young people to believe that there is some stable, trustworthy, reliable truths if our bodies themselves can't speak to us. In our present circumstances, therefore, the last thing we need is facile talk about critical thinking. A postmodern reading of Shakespeare may teach us useful lessons about race, class, gender, and other human realities that we must reckon with. But the direction is downward. Critical analysis, as it is presently understood, is reductionistic in the sense that it tends to resolve complex human realities into lower things, such as instinct, self-interest, and the will to power. This downward move inevitably disenchants. In fact, it's the essence of disenchantment, to move things down, uh, to take ideals and, and show that they, are, they stem from things that are below. And truth's spiritual po possibilities are necessarily limited. I think we should contrast this direction, which I think is characteristic of our age of weakening, this downward direction of, of of the life of the mind. I should, we should contrast this direction of analysis with what we find in Plato. So in Plato's dialogues, critical questioning invariably drives the interlocutors upward. We are in a cave, imagining that the shadows on the wall are truth itself. And Socrates does not seek to overcome that self-deception with a strategy of disenchantment. Instead, he urges us to turn and rise to leave the cave of our illusions so that our minds can be filled with the purifying light of truth. The Christian tradition encourages this exactly the same upward turning movement, although it stipulates that we can do so only with God's help. Now, it's, I believe that we need to recover the upward movement in higher education. And it won't come by appeals to authority nor will it be made possible by pious exhortations. Instead, we need a pedagogy of enchantment, one that is willing to entertain metaphysical ambition, and one that takes a risk of fanning in young people the ever-present, yet presently dampened desire for the transcendent. Thank you. <laughs>